All right, so now we're going to start. Uh, so we're going to give you a little bit of a, just a history of the junior hockey in Canada, uh, an overview of what the bus crash was and the response that we did, as well as some of the stories of the SISM response. So if you want to flip the next one. First, I'll start it off by telling you a little bit about Humboldt, about who we are. We're a community of about 6,000 people. We're located about 100 kilometers or 60 miles east of Saskatoon. Uh, agriculture and uh, mining is our two main industries that we have within our, our region. We have about 85 full-time staff in our city and uh, a fire department that's made up of two full-time members and 26 volunteers. The Humble Broncos organization is a local junior A hockey team and has been for the past 48 years. And like any organization like these, they rely on board members and a very small staff to operate. They struggle financially, but are a very important part of our community. The organization was made up of head coach Darcy Hogan, his wife Christine, who was the office administrator, and along with a handful of support staff. The audio clip you just heard at the beginning was from our game four, and our game, game four April 4th, 2018, against the Nippon Hawks. And uh, Nickman Hawks have been Hawks have been one of our greatest rivals in the past, and as have you heard, the uh, the game did go into triple overtime. It was a good, a really good game that I did attend. Okay. Then on April 6, 2018, the Humble Broncos were on their way to Nip One for Game Five, when approximately around 5 p.m., the Broncos bus was involved in a serious accident. The crash occurred roughly 170 kilometers outside of Humboldt at the intersections of 35 and 335. The result of the accident was 16 fatalities and 13 injured. Okay. So a little bit about the Humble Fire Department. We're, we're our volunteer fire department mm -hmm. and uh, I'll explain in the second half of the presentation what our role was over the weekend and a little bit about hockey in Canada. Hockey is a very important uh, part of most Canadian small towns. It's, uh, it's something that every kid grew up playing. Every, uh, every town had a rink, a hockey rink, and they, uh, it was basically the central social hub for the community. Many of the parents that had their, their kids in hockey used it as part of their social. There are many levels of hockey that uh, to progress through in order to play in the, provincial, or in the professional league. Junior A is just one of those steps. Kids are drafted from all over Canada. So the kids that were in Humboldt were from all over Manitoba, Alberta, and uh, even beyond that. And uh, the kids that were brought into these teams are often paired up with families that we call billet families. So they have billet parents and, and even billet brothers and sisters. So they're taken into, uh, into families and they're, they're housed as one of their own. The kids' rage, ages range from 16 to 20. So a lot of them are already in high school. They're, they have kids that are they're friends with and, uh, and a lot of the billet families they get very, very close to. So not only did this affect the families that were involved, but it also affected the billet families because they became part of their family. So like I said, it's, uh, it's something that, uh, that many, many people were involved with. It was spread out over a really wide area, not just in Humboldt, but in many provinces and, and uh, far beyond that. So I'll let Patty and Lori take it from here. Okay, so I think it's important first to give you just an overview of the numbers that were involved. At the scene, there were over 100 firefighters, volunteer firefighters from three different departments. Uh, there was EMS from a variety of different departments as well. Um, they run with two in a, an ambulance, and at this point they were bringing in all hands on deck. So there were as many people as possible could respond. They had a third, one, one organization had an extra ambulance for some reason, um, and so they were able to employ that one as well. Um, beyond that, uh, so you can see Tisdale, Nipwin, and Zenon Park were the fire departments that we provided support for, all volunteers, again. Um, the Northeast Ambulance Service, Tisdale Ambulance Service, Melford Ambulance Service, and Humboldt Ambulance Service actually got involved in transporting from, uh, to the, the airport where helicopters were staged in order to uh, remove some of the patients. Um, 
Also on the scene were Ministry of, of, of Environment Conservation Officers. Now, if you're from Canada, you know who those people are. Um, down in the States, these would have been originally park rangers, all right? Um, and they have special uh, responsibilities in the north. They're actually used uh, at times as police officers. They are used as support for RCMP. And certainly in this situation, there were six young, well-trained, conservation officers, some of them just new on the job, some of them had been there for a period of time, but never had any of them been to an accident scene like this. And so those six also responded too. We also want to give, uh, give just a, a moment to talk about the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Um, they not only were on scene, they also provided support throughout the time of extrication and then did, um, then were on scene to secure it during uh, the recovery period and also had to do all the identification. So their job was very stressful as well. It's important for you to also know that because of the nature of proximity, these organizations and these teams, these, these, these fire departments are very far north. They're three, four, five hours away from Regina, which is the biggest city close to them. Um, and so they rely on each other very heavily when it comes to mutual aid support. Off-site support, people that came in beyond that would be STARS Medevac. Now there were three helicopters in the province at that time. There was one that had just come in for apparently maintenance or something else, but it was able to be used as well. Uh, there were two, to my knowledge, two fixed-wing medevac uh, transports. Uh, we also had 911 dispatch in Prince Albert, which is totally separate community from where this happened. And again, the RCMP. Uh, Tisdale Hospital and Nipwin Hospital were the two hospitals where all of the injured were transported from the accident scene. As you saw on the map, uh, Nipwin is above the accident scene, Tisdale is below the accident scene, and Melfort was a little bit further to the southwest. Melfort was going to be one of the places where they, they brought people, but because of the nature of the situation, um, they were only transported to Tisdale and Nipwin and then removed from there to the Royal University Hospital in Saskatoon. Uh, another part of this, though, is, is also because the Royal University Hospital is a, is a level one trauma center, for those of you who look at that from the United States perspective. Um, but because of that, the hospitals in Regina were then staged to take every other trauma, every other situation from anywhere else in the, in the province in order to free up the emergency room staff, the ICU, and the surgical staffs at the RUH, which was two hours away from Regina. So the whole province was affected by this. For our CISM perspective, there were 12 members of our team <laughs> that were involved, um, five members of the Saskatoon Fire Department team, and we had offers from counseling services and CISM teams from around the world. Thank you to Alberta, who had two teams staged for us if we were in need. We, and they were peer firefighters. Um, we also had an offer from England, uh, and we didn't need them. Uh, but what we did was make sure that we had the extra backup support just in case. And for the timing purposes and the rotation of your team members, and as we go through that, um, you'll see why we needed people at certain times and other times we staged for extra support and didn't, didn't necessarily need them. Um, looking back now, we have some lessons learned about that that we'll share at the end. On Friday, April 6th, at about 5.25, I was contacted by Lori and started getting texts from three of our team members. Some of them are paramedics, some of them are firefighters, so they were aware before I was aware. I was actually down in North Dakota at my daughter's baby shower. She was having twins. So I was down there and the phone started buzzing. And so um, as they were calling, we had no information about how many injuries. We knew it was a bus with passengers. We also knew that it was a semi that was involved as well. But at the time when we first got the contact, we weren't sure. I got texts from one of our team members saying that they had been told there were more than 30 fatalities. Then I got contact from emergency management and fire safety and the director of operations was able to tell me at that time that they had, they had um, eight people that were injured so far. So we had, we were getting different information all along but as soon as we heard, we began staging for that response. I also got a call from Lori, because she was, she was, and she'll tell you what her job was here in just a couple of minutes, but I got a call from Lori asking for some support, uh, just, just telephone calls to make sure that we could smooth the way with some of the things that were going on in her 
particular area because she was involved in this response as well for the mental health support. And then um, Mike called me and I remember his words, there's eight of us standing here in a circle, Patty, what do we do? And so we were able to give him some insight into it. We just had a quick discussion about staging at the hockey rink because people will be gathering there and then what do you do after that? Saskatoon Fire Chief contacted me. He's trained in SISM and he has a solid SISM team, so he offered them as well. And so they're only an hour and a half away from the location, so we were able to access some of them, especially in that first few days because we weren't quite sure what we were up against. There we go. Um, talked about emergency management and fire safety. Uh, the Director of Operations, they were in contact with me that night, off and on for the next several hours. The phone didn't stop ringing from 5.30 until 11.30 that night. And I was on the computer emailing and texting and making phone calls too. Also got contacted by the Ministry of Justice with Victim Services. Victim Services in Canada is the victim support organization that works through the RCMP. And so we knew that they would also be part of the response. They're, um, they're an organization outside of the, f the federal or provincial organizations, but they wanted to let me know, because I've worked with them in the past, they wanted to let me know they'd have people up there as well, and so just to, just to liaison, just to make a connection. And then the last one was with Workers' Compensation Board. We have a connection with Workers' Comp because we did some training with them, because firefighters who are referred for mental health support and ongoing counseling in Canada are able to file a claim with workers' comp so that their workers' compensation, so that their salary is covered, that their counseling services are covered uh, for that period of time that they need the extra support. So we were beginning to set up that network of help surrounding everything that would need to be done over the next couple of days, next few weeks. All right, Lori, I think you're on. Do you want me to click? Please. Click? No. Okay. Um, so as I stated earlier, um, I've worked for mental health for the last 30-some years, but my involvement with the SISM team is separate from my, um, my employment. Um, so anyhow, it was Friday evening. I just basically gotten home from work. It was about 5.20. I got a call from my boss. And he knew that I was doing some trauma work and was on the uh, provincial SISM team separate from my employment. Anyhow, he called and he said, Lori, he said, I just got word that um, there's been a bus semi-accident. Can you head to the hospital? And I said, absolutely. So I only live two blocks from the hospital, so I was on my way and I'm thinking, bus accident. My kids are all done school and I'm thinking, what sporting event is, is still going on? Um, and I'm thinking, is it volleyball? So anyhow, I get to the hospital and then it dawned on me, um, there's no school right now because it's Easter break. Anyhow, I walk in and I met up with my boss and he informed me um, that it was the humble um, Broncos on their way to Nipwin. Um, at that time, they didn't know how many incoming casualties would be um, coming to Melfort. They were still, at that point, it was still early, it was before six o'clock between Melfort, Tisdale, and um, Nipwin, um, the powers that be were still deciding how to coordinate all of this. But I knew when I got to the hospital at that point, we were expecting a number of casualties and victims coming to Melfort. So I went and got my rooms ready, knowing that I'd be uh, dealing with the families. Um, the staff at the hospital, it was quite amazing, actually, to see um, all the emergency staff, the GPs, all the nurses, LPNs, even, the, even um, housekeeping and dietary um, get ready um, as they were expecting a number of people to attend to Melford Hospital. Anyhow, it didn't take long. Everything was ready. Um, standing in a merge, waiting. And at that point in time, it was dead silence. You could hear a pin drop. Anyhow, one of the GPs who was sort of coordinating the event, um, the phone rang, he answered, and he announced to us, ETA, 10 minutes. Again, just did dead silence in Emerge, we're waiting. Within a few uh, seconds of that phone call, we got another one, he answered, and 
he said, okay, he hung up the phone. He said, we aren't getting any uh, casualties or victims. They're all being um, deployed to uh, Tisdale. Apparently at that point in time, they were coordinating. They decided that Melfort was going to be uh, head of communications and all the casualties were gonna go to um, Nipwin and to Tisdale. So from that point on, everybody just stopped and the doctors, nurses, um, including myself, my boss said to me, Lori, can you head to Tisdale? Absolutely. And by that time, I'd been getting texts um, based on all the phone calls um, indicating that our SISM team was being deployed, they were making arrangements, and they'd be arriving in uh, Tisdale Saturday. So anyhow, that evening, I um, took off to um, Tisdale, and I walked into the Tisdale Hospital, and the only way that I can sort of describe it because I've never been involved in anything um, this catastrophic. Um, I walked into hosp the Tis Tisdale Hospital, the waiting room, and it was like a scene from MASH. Um, I'm looking around and I'm assuming that most of you know what TV show I'm referring to. Some of you probably don't. Um, but it was, yeah, there's no words kind of to describe it. In any event, um, I had a thought in my mind that night that um, I'm probably going to have to do some notification tonight. Anyhow, I went down the hallway and I went and met up with some colleagues, some other um, couple social workers and community mental health nurses that I work with. They had already gotten our rooms ready. Um, and I walk into the room and families had already started gathering. Um, so there are a number of families in that room, and again, I'm thinking um, notification that was just kept playing in the back of my mind. And I walked in, one of the family members was um, sitting there, and uh, she had a um, rosary beads. And I saw her, and that just kind of sort of hit me in the gut. Anyhow, as the evening went on, uh, we spent time with the families, and it... For the families, it became quite um, quite stressful because it ended up being a waiting game. Um, as Patty and and Mike indicated, Tisdale is about is it 20 minutes, half an hour, Mike, from from Nipwin, right? So everybody had all the casualties and survivors had, like I said, been deployed between Tisdale and Nipwin, and all the deceased were in Nipwin, so us and Tisdale, we were waiting to get names. So anyhow, as information started filtering down, um, the RCMP in Nipwin were contacting the RCMP in Tisdale, and he was with us at the hospital. So we were just getting names and trying to put names to family members and trying to coordinate all that. And as Patty and Mike mentioned, um, because one of the family members had said that in, the, in uh, the room that night. She was sort of talking to herself, but kind of talking out loud, and she said, she started talking about identification, and she made mention that it's gonna be so difficult because in playoffs, right, um, everybody dyes their hair, or cuts their hair, and as you saw from the picture, right, um, the team that night, they all look very similar because of their, um, the color of the hair and the haircuts. Anyhow, so we started getting names and um, via Nipwin staff. Um, yeah, and that night we started um, doing notification to the family members that were sitting in our family room that night. Um, it was a long process. Um, it was obviously, as I mean, as you all know, quite devastating to those families. So anyhow, myself and uh, the colleagues that I work with, we um, were in Tisdale maybe till about three o'clock. Um, well, I guess it'd be Sunday morning, but Saturday night. By the time we were finished, it was 3, 3, 3, 3.30. So that was, uh, that was Friday night in the night of the accident. <clears throat> um, so Saturday morning, or Saturday night, Saturday morning, um, started getting 
texts, emails, phone calls. Um, I was notified that our CISN team was being deployed. We had CISN members um, traveling three, four hours away within Saskatchewan. Uh, so Saturday we met in Tisdale, we made our plan. Um, Saturday night we started our debriefings. Our first debriefing was with um, Tisdale Fire and EMS. Um, and it was during that debriefing that we started making note of people that we possibly thought we'd need to refer. We started doing those assessments, um, documenting. Um, that was Saturday night. Then once we did our pass, our debriefing amongst our team, we started talking about Sunday and making another plan. So Sunday, after we finished in Tisdale Saturday night, the plan was Sunday we were going to do a debriefing with the paramedics that were on scene Friday night at the accident. Um, and with them there was the conservation officers. So part of our team was going to be de debriefing the paramedics in Nipwin. The other half of our team were needing to go up to Zenon Park and do the debriefing for fire and EMS. But between those two locations, they're only like 15 minutes apart between Nipwin and, and Zenon Park. And I should mention, Zenon Park is what, the population of 500 people? Yeah, and, and Nipwin is what? 4,000. 4, so, um, as you can imagine, everybody knows everybody and everybody is somewhat connected. And especially in a small town in Saskatchewan, a population of 500, pretty much related to everybody. Um, so we had our plan, have a, three of us, four of us were meeting in, in Nipwin to do the paramedics and conservation officers. And the other half, as I stated, were going to Zenon Park. But we needed to do some quick thinking and um, some coordinating. The other half of our team got to Zenon Park and were informed that there were a number of civilians on scene that indicated they wanted to come to this debriefing. The chief there spoke to um, spoke to our team member who was gonna be doing the leading. So they needed to do some quick changes and they just made it work. They had to do what they had to do in the moment. In the meantime, uh, myself and Kevin and the other person that was coordinating in Patty's absence, because as Patty stated, she wasn't, she was away that weekend. Um, excuse me. I wanted some of those team members with me just by the very nature of what we were doing and I needed some of my team members were also um, paramedics. Anyhow, because of what was going on in Zen and Park, here in Nippon, we needed to do what we needed to do and we needed to make it work. So that's what we did. Sometimes you just work, you just gotta make some changes to make it, make it work and that's what we did. Um, and as I stated, Saskatchewan's very small and everybody's connected and somebody knows somebody. Um, I knew going into um, debriefing the paramedics um, that, that evening, Sunday, Sunday night, that there were some paramedics um, that were quite young. Um, they had just graduated. Some of them had just graduated six months before and I knew one of them quite, uh, know her personally. Um, so that was in the back of my mind. Um, and the extent of this accident, the, the paramedics, they hadn't been exposed to something this tragic, especially um, the young ones. So you sort of had that in the back of your mind and, and very concerned for them. Um, Monday, where are we here? Monday. Um, Can I ask a question? Yes, please. If they, you say they were only 15 minutes apart, these two communities. Mm -hmm. What was the reason that you, you didn't because um, that would have been too too many people and the people in Zenon Park right that were on scene they wanted to have that debriefing done in their own community and the paramedics they wanted to be debriefed alone with their own group the other thing too is is to keep in mind that we mentioned it on the slide 
we did five phase debriefing. So if you've had the advanced course, you know that the five phase debriefing is done when a diffusing isn't enough, but you gotta do something fast because emotions are this high. And so that was the decision that was made. Um, the nature of exposure for Zen and Park was a little bit different too. They were the third group called in. And by that time, it, it was about an hour of transporting people out. And so by that time, their level of exposure would have been different as well. They would have been kept on the periphery, so. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, we'll just do this together. Yep. You betcha. Okay. Um, we had some discussions. Uh, one of the things we haven't told you is that on Nippon Fire Department, there were four members of our SISM team. So we had four peers, three firefighters and the chief. Who, and the chief wasn't on our team, but he's been trained. And so um, they were well aware of what was happening. They were also well aware of the things that we would need as we came in. So we were getting information that evening from the scene. This department also was on scene for f about 48 hours, I think, um, until everything was cleared. So they had the, the, the deepest level of exposure. Um, in that time, we also had just some really, <sighs> one of our team members told his fire department, you can talk to these guys. They care and they know what's going, what's going on. They know what you're going through. You can talk to them, it's okay which cleared the way for us. It really did, it cleared the way for us. We didn't have to explain ourselves or justify ourselves at all. They just opened the door. Um, and it was very effective. Uh, one of the things that, that we wanna tell you about that, that evening, the debriefing that we did, um, one of our team members, his name is Harry Wilkins, he's a deputy chief on Yorkton Fire Department. Harry led the debriefing because he knew them and I know we're kind of getting in the area of you're not supposed to do your own. He's not their own, but because they knew him from other training, because he was a friend of the chief, because he is so good at what he does, that debriefing was something that, you know, we look back now and say, if you could tape an actual intervention, that would be one we could use to teach because it was that effective. That's one of the ones we talk about where you can, you can feel the energy change in the room at the, re at the end of the reaction phase. It was that impactful for these people. Um, we had uh, Lori and myself, and I think it was four other team members who did the debriefing for that group because everyone came to that one. Everyone from that department came in. And they, again, they asked for it just to be them. They didn't, they, they asked that we not include anyone else outside of that group for a lot of reasons, but, um, but it was very effective. It also gave us an opportunity, I want to mention something too, it gave us an opportunity that day, we'll talk about conspicuous loitering here in a, in a few minutes, but it gave us a chance to do assessments right then because we stayed at the fire hall. They were all staying at the fire hall, so we just went in with a couple of peers and the chief gave us his office and one of us would sit in there and it was like a revolving door for a while. Firefighters would come in and talk and we did one-on-ones that way before we ever got to the debriefing part. But what that did was give us the benefit of one-on-one -on -one assessment and realizing then we had to make some referrals. And so by the evening, when we got the debriefing set up and the timing was set, Lori was doing assessments and making referrals. So, okay. Can we talk about this one? Yes. No, is it me? What's no, go me? ahead. Okay. Um, what I want to talk to you about, too, as far as making referrals, uh, because Lori was in the area, this is her community, um, she also knew what clinicians were skilled and would be capable if we needed to make referrals. So she made some calls and got these clinicians, told them what was going on, got them, they knew of course from the news, but got them on board to clear their schedules. So we had the opportunity to get firefighters, paramedics who needed the assistance within two to three days in to see face to face with a psychologist which is unheard of in many places, but we were able to do that. They cleared their schedules, and then we contacted workers' comp, and they were already up there establishing files on many people. We told the firefighters as well, just start a file. Even if you don't feel you need it right now, somewhere down the line, this marks a moment in time for you. So if somewhere three or four years down the line you have a reaction to something, this will mark a moment in time for you. And so they worked in collaboration with us as well. And they provided as much support as they could and made sure that if they saw anyone that they had concerns about, that they let them know to talk to us too. So we had a really good relationship with them from the start and I think it benefited everyone there. 
Um, again, in the, in the daytime, we did individual support. And again, there is so much benefit to just being available there um, because they felt like they needed to stay at the fire hall. And for us, it was just because for them, it was a safe place. Um, some of them felt awkward going home. They didn't want their spouses to see them as they were. And so this was a safe place. And what it did was also empower them to support each other. And, and so we began doing, at that point, we began doing some spouse support too, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, I've done it before because I've been involved in this kind of work for a long time, but Lori saw the need. We talked to some of the firefighters. We saw the need that we should support them. There's actually research now that shows that if you educate the partners and spouses of a person who's involved in something traumatic, that their recovery process is actually increased. And so we felt this was the most important thing that we could do at the time. And so we began first with the firefighters, paramedics, and then with their spouses so that we covered everybody. And again, Wednesday, the same thing. Um, we were doing things one-on-ones throughout the day, checking in with people, making referrals, <coughs> follow-up, and then doing evening activity as well. And, and I, and, and I want to say something about the spouse support uh, as well. That was so key. I never have I seen a change happen <laughs> so quickly, but that was so key in the work that we did because they were just as distressed. They were just as distressed as their firefighters or their paramedic partners. All right. And it really had a huge impact. Um, we also met with WCB just to make sure that we didn't forget anyone, we didn't miss anyone, or that they hadn't missed anyone. And so, you know, keeping confidentiality in, intact, we also wanted to make sure that agencies were seen to uh, as far as what needs they had. And on Thursday, um, I did follow up with the Ministry of Environment Conservation Officers. I, I work with them in the summertime. And so um, I did the follow up with them. They also have a SISM team who was then on, on site for that intervention. It was, it was more of an educational sort of crisis management briefing. Um, but we made sure that the referrals were in place for them as well and that they were aware of who their EFAP connections were, EFAP Employee Family Assistance Program, uh, who those EFAP people were so that we could follow through with them as well. And then on that day, Thursday, April 12th, six days after this happened, uh, we released all the team members to go home for the first week. And we gave them about 10 days then, not 10, about a week, um, to just be on their own. It was almost <laughs> the weekend, and we had done everything that we felt was appropriate, all the one-on-ones, all the group interventions, all the support, and we felt that it was important now to step away, and we just told them, we're gonna give you the weekend now and we'll check in with you next week. Also met with emergency management and fire safety, and I actually counted the pages. I had six pages of organizations and individuals that had contacted emergency management and fire safety, which is a provincial organization, to provide help and support. Um, what they said was, here, <coughs> who do you need? And I looked through the list and I said, I, I chose two. One of them was Alberta, and one of them was another organization in Saskatchewan, Saskatoon Fire Department. Um, Regina Fire Department was also trained, but they're a fairly new team. So I said, well, let's not do that. But what we found is that we had no way of knowing credentials for people. And they could say anything about themselves. And they did. <laughs> Psychotraumatologist. Okay. <laughs> but we had no way of identifying that. And so I said to EMFS, just no. No, if we know people, we'll call them. And they said, all right, you're the gatekeeper for this one. The other thing that's important for you guys to know is that the EOC was set up in the community of Humboldt. We were 170 kilometers away. So we were able to do everything we needed to do without interference. We checked in with them just to make sure that we had support if we needed it. That was about it. We were able to do the things we needed to do with nobody else bothering us. There were some media attention here and there, but most of it was in Humboldt. And so that was the place that things were set up because that was where all the action was really as far as that part goes. Um, but by doing that, it freed us up to work in our space without interference. And it helped greatly for the firefighters and the paramedics because they didn't have a lot of media around asking questions or bothering them. So it gave them some safety. 
April 19th to the 22nd, so a week and a few days later, was the Nipwin Fire School. It had been scheduled a year before. We talked to the chief about canceling it or <coughs> postponing it, and he said, you know, these guys could use something to do. So let's go ahead and do it. They know how to do this. It will help them stay active and get involved again. And so, ironically, our team, there on the team that was up there, there were four of us who were instructors. And so we were going to teach a group crisis intervention course that weekend. So we had that planned already. There were something like 24 participants. And so we went ahead and did that. But what we had to do in, in that uh, situation then was designate people who would be instructing and people who would be available in a, a peer support room. And so we had a room set up. We brought in two more team members um, just to provide support at the booth and to be available for the room. And then our team of teachers handed things off back and forth. And so we covered all areas then as we needed to. It was important because at one point we did have one individual come in and so Lori stepped out and spent about an hour and a half with that person. And, uh, and so those are the things that we found were important. The other thing that I didn't mention, the Chiefs Conference was the weekend before. And so Mike attended the Chiefs Conference as well. But we also had trained team members there, um, just in case. And some of them are Chiefs. So we were able to provide that support if there was a need. The, um, sorry, ahead. the other p significant uh, part of that weekend of the fire school, one of our instructors who was yes. um, scheduled to, to uh, teach with teach with us that weekend um, just before we started she got in a call she lives what four, four and a half about four and a half away. hours south of Nippon where we were she had gotten a call there had been a tragic event down there at her fire department so her team was needing her back at home um, and so we had to do some juggling um, in regards to our instructors as well as she needed support mm -hmm. um, for her own, she needed SISM down there, mm -hmm. and we're all like four hours north. So, yeah, in, in part of this too, that was the beginning of uh, a rash of other traumatic events. We had two people that were triggered by this incident who lived in different parts of the province, one who is in acute need of support. Um, and, and so we were contacted for those two individuals uh, Lori was able to make some connections for them and they were referred for mental health support right away. One of them in an urgent way and the other one was, was able to do this within his own region of the province. We also had uh, a double homicide, we had a suicide and we had a motor vehicle accident with a rollover with two young people and the suicide and the two young people were between the ages of 19 and 22. All in five weeks of while we were doing this other one. So we kept a few of the team members out intentionally. Thank goodness. <laughs> Thank goodness we had the foresight to do it. But, um, but that's part of what, that's what happens sometimes. And we kind of said, well, enough is enough, and finally things settled down, so. Okay. Um, these are the follow-up meetings. And um, we did, we came back on, on May 3rd and did did, uh, no, May, May 3rd, I talked to you. That was when you and I had a discussion. I stopped there on the way home from doing some training up north. And I spent an afternoon in Humboldt and uh, just sort of sat and listened and did some visiting. Um, the, we had a team ready and staged to go to Humboldt to support them as well. But they had other supports in place. And there was never, uh, and Mike was aware, all he had to do was call. But um, <laughs> there was never a need that was established at that time. Um, May 11th. Uh, we did a follow-up with Zenon Park, uh, EMS and first responders, May 12th, so that was a weekend again where we went back up and did a follow-up. Now that was sort of the end. Our plan was this will be the last, and it was the fifth week, not the fourth week, to check in with people. We also noticed at this time that there were a few more that were starting to show signs of symptoms. So um, at that point, Lori then got engaged with that situation and made referrals for mental health support uh, for those few people that again showed this began to show up and you'll notice too you know when you're looking at major disasters that can happen at a variety of times a three month period the six month period at the anniversary date there's times where other things might happen where that person is triggered now too so we were very vigilant about watching that and educating them about what to do if they do notice so there was a lot of education that went into all of this june 28th um that was the the week prior to this i just called there were a handful of people that we were following up with. Um, and, and they were people, some of them were in 
follow-up counseling. Some of them were not, but we did a, I did some follow-up with them, just some phone calls. And what I found was I was actually answering the same set of questions for every single one. And so I called Lori and I said, something's odd here. I'm answering the same questions with each of these people. And we talked it over and she said, I think you should come up again, which is about a three and a half, four hour drive for me. I think you should come up again. Let's meet with this group and talk to them. And it really was, um, it was an important, an important counseling time. I mean, Lori was able to explain about some things. Uh, we were able to do some, um, just encouraging too, just some encouraging things um, and, and really encourage people to carry on. You know, sometimes when you're, when you're going through a traumatic event, you feel like you get stuck and you sort of go, well, what's the purpose here? And, and so we were able to boost the morale and do some things that were supportive there. When we decided to do the group, um, there was a group about uh, five people, and I think the sixth one was um, sort of their support person. And like Patty said, they were asking the same questions, having um, had the same concerns. And by that time, this group of people, I had already made referrals to um, to their GPs because it gotten to the point that coping. Um, everyday coping was definitely being impaired and it wasn't just um, stress or acute stress symptoms it had progressed anyhow this group of people uh, were already in contact with their therapists their doctors etc um, so anyhow we had the group and lots of teaching was done in regards to um, signs symptoms medications I'm not a doctor I didn't do any of that but I just did lots of patient teaching and it seemed that it was um, beneficial because it, it sort of normalized a lot of things. Um, they were able to um, identify that they had similar issues and they also utilized the one person that they had as a main support. And he was sort of the, the go-between and these guys basically gave him permission to do that. Um, so in essence, it was sort of like a little self-help group and lots of teaching was done that day. We gave, we gave all departments an option um, on the anniversary date because, you know, there are times where that's really significant and powerful. Um, in Humboldt, there was going to be a memorial service. Um, we also realized that for some of the firefighters, this date would still be significant for years to come. And so we contacted each one and said, here's, here's what we'd like to offer. Can we come a week before the anniversary date? Can we be there on the weekend of the anniversary date? Or should we wait for a week after? to a person, they said, wait till a week after. Part of what they were worried about is the media attention on the anniversary date, and they thought, well, if we wait a week, then we can talk about that too. And so it worked out quite well. And we didn't make anything mandatory. We gave them the option of coming or not. Would you like to talk individually, or would you like to talk in the group? And Lori put together a script for follow-up um, that really focused more on the healing aspects of recovery and it gave them a chance to talk again. And what we saw was um, the healing process in place. We saw a number of people who came but wanted us to know that they were okay now. They, they had done their work, they were okay now. We also had a few that we identified because it had been a year, could use a little extra support, and so we took care of that. We also had people that didn't attend because they didn't want to. They didn't want to, they felt they didn't need to, which was perfectly normal too for all of us. So, so in that, yes? Sorry, when you, when you guys contacted these people, you contacted each of the 100 responders, or, or did you contact people, like contact people for them? Or? We contacted the chiefs, yeah. and we didn't do the civilians. Um, right. By that point, there were 31 civilians involved at the scene, people that were passers-by and yeah. such. They were taken care of by social services and, and mental health services in the in their region but we contacted each of the agencies and said would you let us know what you think because we're common we're going to be there and if anything if there's any need let us know and we also contacted individuals that we had been in contact with through the course of the year just to let them know we're coming um, also uh, Lori before the anniversary date Lori sent out an email to the chiefs to share with everyone saying you might notice that on the anniversary date or that weekend you feel a resurgence in some reactions. And so we gave, gave that as an opportunity of educating. 
and it worked out really well. It worked, it, and we didn't have, you know, these teams you guys know in rural settings, they, they stick together. And so they came together, and even the ones that were in need of extra support or had been or still were in counseling attended as well. So they got that support from one another, and it was nice to have them back in the fire hall. So. Okay. This is a <laughs> we did it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this is the, the end of part one. Okay, we're going to carry on in just a few minutes. Um, we could do a, where are we at for time? It's 1125. My gosh, we did it exactly on. So um, if, if you.